Welcome, everybody, to the 6-5 Podcast. I'm your host today, Daniel Newman, Principal Analyst and Founding Partner at Futurum Research, joined by my always esteemed co-host, co-host at large, co-hosting crime, co-host brilliante, Mr. Patrick <laughs> Moorhead, Principal Analyst and More Insights and Strategy. Patrick Moorhead, good Monday afternoon. How are you? Daniel, good to see you. I haven't heard that intro, the very uh, uh, the end of that. That was a new one. Thank you very much. Like well, I said, if if all if if all I had you was introducing me every time, life would be perfect. Hey, uh, we're seventy some odd uh, episodes of our regular show, and then another what uh, thirty or forty insider editions. And it's time to you know spice it up a little bit. And we had a great it really is. With our guest of honor, who will be joining us in just a few minutes, and he had us laughing about the Techno King, and I was just thinking we need the Techno King intro. And by the way, that wasn't it, but it wasn't bad. Um, <laughs> this, by the way, is a Six Five Insider Edition, and we are very excited to be hosting Pega CEO Alan Treffler. By the way, for the second time, Alan's joined us once before, and this is about a year later. Some big news at Pega, and we are excited to have him back. But uh, for everyone out there that is tuning in right now, whether you're listening to us just after us publishing this or months later, we are excited to have you. Keep hitting that subscribe button, share this with your friends. We promise to keep it interesting, bringing the best and brightest of tech on our show. And of course, covering and analy analyzing the biggest news in tech each and every week. But without further ado, Pat, you think we should bring Alan onto the show? Let's bring the king of tech in right now. Oh, a new name. Let's see how he likes it. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I can live up to that, Dan and Pat, but uh, thanks, and it's always great to be on the show. Well, we love to have you for sure, and uh, you know, it is incredible. It's been a, a year already, but uh, we're glad to have you on. Well, it's felt like a lot longer, I think, than a year, as we all know, but uh, maybe this is a good harbinger. You sort of had me as the you know, pandemic was entering, and perhaps now is it uh, a departing. That might work well. Like bookends. Yeah, but it, it it has been great getting a bunch of CEO perspectives uh, on on the topic of the past year, and they all have all had different tech uh, different takes on how they were how they seen the business, technology, their clients, customers, distributors, and everything else. Um, any any you know, I know it's hard to distill over a year into a couple minutes, but but what have you seen over the past year that has really um been highlighted for you well obviously it's been a year where digital transformation has gotten real and a lot of organizations i believe have uh, had to really hustle to make things work and uh, had to actually do things in in days and in weeks that they would have thought would have taken years but at the same time that this has been very exciting for digital transformation and gotten a lot of people thinking in a way that well we've been encouraging them to think uh, it's also been interesting because I think it's shown a lot of companies the gaps that they have in terms of not just dealing with you know what's in front of us, but how they need to really rethink their businesses, how they engage with customers, how they go to market, how they optimize their internal workflows, how they apply AI. All of these things uh, have really, I believe, been tested by the swift introduction of the pandemic. Yeah, it's been a really crazy year. And I think as we all headed into this, Alan, I think we all pretty much thought that, you know, it was weeks, maybe, maybe month or two. There was like that weird moment sometime when you were like, oh, man, this thing's not going away anytime soon. Oh, Daniel, it's two weeks of lockdowns. Didn't you hear? <laughs> I know, but I'm saying like, I think. Even at the time when we talked, I think we were still kind of in that mindset. Like, yeah. how many companies were like, "Yeah, we're 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 holding on. We're not going to cancel our event. Just stand by. We're getting back to you. We're going to get through this." And then all of a sudden, you were like, "Whoa, this thing's going to last the you know into summer." And then in the summer, you're like, "Okay, we're we're getting better." And then the fall, and now the spring. And I mean, I got my first invite, Alan, to a live event late this year. But you were talking about eight. 18 months for a couple of guys and Pat and I, and I'm sure yourself, that spent 50 weeks, 49, 50 weeks going event to event, going nowhere. Well, if you would have told me that for an entire year, I would not have gotten on an airplane, I would have told you that you were just nuts. But 
you know, among the changes that this has driven is, uh, you know, the fact that we're all recruiting and hiring and thinking differently about our teams, uh, about how we engage with our teams and now often are engaging with their families as they periodically enter the room during the meetings, how we augment our teams and how we hire. You know, in uh, June of last year, I brought on an extremely senior person to basically take over and, and run uh, all of our go-to-market, how we engage with our customers, how we sell, all of those key elements. And if you had told me at the beginning of the year that I would hire this terrific guy without ever having met him, I would have said that that would be inconceivable. And yet, when we got to it, you know, the choice was either dwaddling or going ahead and doing what so many companies have had to do, which is really challenge some of their perceptions. Well, you clearly took advantage of a year that was pretty horrific on society, but actually quite friendly for technology. The tech industry as a whole had a very good year. And, and you recently uh, announced a pretty significant milestone, uh, breaking that billion dollar revenue barrier. Exciting, congratulations, Alan. Great to know that we worked with you before you hit a billion. <laughs> now we expect to work with you more, that you have hit a billion. Um, but I wanted to just kind of hear from you. I mean, that's, that is a very small club. And despite the fact that we hear about trillion dollar market caps more often than you would believe now, hitting a billion dollars in revenue is a really significant accomplishment, something you should be very proud of. But I'd love to hear just a little bit. You broke this during the pandemic. You went from less to over. What, what do you, I mean, you kind of mentioned, what are you attributing a lot of that to? Well, I think that uh, our staff has shown a tremendous resilience and creativity in terms of figuring out how to do things differently. You know, for the first 48 hours after the pandemic hit, I wasn't sure how it was gonna go. But by the time we had 72 hours, I realized that we were gonna be able to deliver for our customers, we're gonna be able to engage creatively with them, gonna be able to really break some barriers and, and actually do it at a record pace. You know, I, I, I've told the story of uh, our in, in, interactions in the first couple of weeks with the state of Bavaria, which is the second largest state in Germany. And what was interesting is the German government was not a customer. So what happened is somebody who had worked for a bank and had worked with our software said, we desperately need PEGA if we're gonna be in a position to, to handle and support all these companies that are at risk of going out of business and are applying for loans and are applying for forbearance. And what we did, uh, would have historically taken us, I would say, you know, weeks or a couple of months. We were in there for one day to do the analysis, what we call a catalyst exercise, where we really look at what's possible. The end of that day, they said go. And by that weekend, we were live taking hundreds of thousands of interactions with their small businesses. And being able to actually um, deliver a distance without the physicality that historically we would have been in you know, one room around a whiteboard actually can bring a real efficiency to how you deliver because you know the customer and we don't have to organize the schedules. We just need to, to reserve the time and you can be there in the moment. It's a, it's a fascinating turn of events. Well, and uh, the other thing about your, your service and product lines is that you are simplifying uh, folks. Right, you're simplifying operations, and I and I feel like it things did get harder. So you were an actual solution to their problems, not some, I don't know, esoteric type of thing. And and by the way, any any type of software or service that requires uh, uh, mandates on-prem interaction, uh, you kind of got to wonder uh, its degree of difficulty. But uh, that's just my take. Uh, well, well, a lot of yeah. it was just you know people were used to congregating around a whiteboard. And right. now the whiteboards are all virtual. And uh, look, anybody who required it is now dead. You know, the reality <laughs> is, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. The, the 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 test was pretty extreme, I would say. But what I'm thrilled about is not just that it was able to get it done, but how much faster and even better it was. Because you know, one of the things about our software that that uh, I think is you know core to our value prop is. Yes, we simplify. We make it really easy to get that first thing done. But the architecture is such that it really lets you model your entire set of business processes in a way that you can bring AI into it, in a way you can update back in systems. 
and in a way that it really um, helps you create a business architecture that's suitable for tough times like these and hopefully the easier ones to come. Yeah, so uh, you've long talked about software that writes software. And as AM, AI and ML continue to have greater influence over technology and software, I'm wondering how are you going to make this even more prevalent uh, into your, your solutions? Well, the, the vision of um, writing software by typing arcane words into text files and compiling them which is the way that you know, nearly all software gets written these days, I think has been antiquated for three decades. What we really need is to be able to model what the objectives of our, of our business are, be able to use AI to optimize, and then literally have products, our product, be able to implement those outcomes in uh, a multi-cloud fashion. And you know, that's particularly apropos now and what I'm excited about is a lot of people are now talking about you know, no code and low code and lots of buzzwords. We have the experience to know what it really takes to be able to deliver that at scale, not just scale in terms of volumes of transactions, but scale in terms of the sophistication that's needed if you're really going to move your business into the technology and into the cloud. Is there any way, does your, is, is the software smart enough today when you're looking at a process, can it even make suggestions of how to streamline a process? Because I'm sure your customers, they, they come in in two sets. First of all, some of them want to relook at their process and come up with a, a new process. Some other, some just want to automate the same process, uh, good, bad, or, or ugly. Well, you, you always want to be looking for opportunities to improve your process and to make better decisions. And if you want to think about PEGA, those are the two things we do. We empower organizations like I was just on the phone last week with Commonwealth Bank of Australia, one of my, not one of my biggest, but one of my favorite customers, who has really used what they call their customer engagement engine, which they are very, very public, is all built on PEGA, to be able to make great decisions and then execute. So for example, beginning of last year, pre-COVID, Australia was overwhelmed by brush fires. That's right. They were able to use this technology to find the people who were at risk of, of frankly, losing their homes and tell them, hey, you don't have to worry about paying your credit card this month. You've got some extra balance. Right. You can pull some cash out. So if you're running for your life, you're not wondering whether your bank is on your side or not. And then when COVID hit, being able to, again, just do revolutionary things in terms of both the decisions they made and then how the processes were executed. All of these can be recursively improved, tested, and you know it's part of not just the software writing the software, think of it as software perfecting the software. My hunch uh, says that a lot of your service folks, uh, because they're so engaged in, um, De helping customers create new process that that your folks are probably pretty good at making suggestions uh, on on how to streamline things because they've been there they've done that and not that you're a consulting organization you're not but you have an arm of people who who can do that and I think I I, I think that would be super valuable uh, at, in times like this well you know it's it's more than just our people because in addition to the about 20% of our team who's involved in that sort of consultative work, uh, and obviously has a lot of experience and has seen a lot of things across industries, we've got tens of thousands of partners, partners. who are able to bring that sort of expertise in. And you know, we work terrifically with those folks. That's a very important route to market for us. And I think together that gives our customers, frankly, the ability to, to learn some of these best practices, but also to them cells become empowered. You know, part of our vision is the customers really want to be owners of their processes, their decisions, and they don't want to really have to delegate that either to outside teams or to data scientists. They, you know, business people need to own the business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you guys have been talking about these topics for years. I can still recall, I don't know if it was a couple of years back, Alan, listening to your CTO, uh, Don Sherman. By the way, always, always gave uh, really fun keynotes. I, I, I still remember kind of quoting a few of his 
data points about AI and ML. Kind of, I remember him talking about how many uh, posts we would have to do on different uh, social networks. I think before it was Facebook, how many times we had to post before Facebook knew us better than we knew ourselves <laughs> uh, was one of his data points. And it effectively, you know, clarified in my own mind that my closest friend is my, uh, is my mobile device by far. Um, That's pretty sad, uh, Daniel. It's definitely the most intimate <laughs> keeper of my life and secrets. But anyways, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's just always been something that's been really focused by your, your company. I, I just want to make sure you're being careful what you post if you're that intimate with your phone. But I that's know, a I know, I know. All right, Dan, all right. Let's pick on Dan. I'm the only one that's phone knows me better than, than, than you know, the others in our lives because I'm sure all of you guys are just sharing everything. Um, but uh, no, in all serious, uh, you guys have been ahead about this topic. You've been definitely on the front foot. Um, but one of the things that I have noticed overall is that, um, you know, competition is starting to come from more places over the last couple of years. I laughingly walked away from the last CEO keynote from AWS reInvent. And I said, well, the new TAM for AWS is IT because apparently they're going to do everything. Um, you know, you're seeing Microsoft uh, making big bets on RPA. Um, the, the term RPA, which is something you were early and often, along with BPO, is now not really RPA. And I mean, everybody, I think, kind of has a consensus. It's about intelligent automation. It's about bringing processes together, incorporating cloud, incorporating uh, AI and ML, things we've been talking about. But Pega, this has been your thing for a long time. Um, I'm kind of curious. You've reached this billion. So let's circle back. How do you, how do you go to the next billion? How do you compete uh, against all these new forces, staying relevant, growing your current customer base. Big question, Alan. You have 50 ways you can take this, but I really want to know, how do you get to 2 billion? Well, and uh, the other part of the question is, how do we do that much faster? You know, oh, one yeah. of the things that uh, we've really invested in in the last 12, 18 months is growing a sales and marketing capacity, really working to deepen our relationship with partners, bringing in talent who has grown businesses, at faster rates than we've grown. Not that I'm complaining, you know, our recurring revenue, which is how we think about our business, you know, has grown 20% a year over the last couple of years, you know, despite, for example, the pandemic. But we believe there's a lot of potential to take this vision that we have, to take our technology, which we certainly believe is superior, and be able to operationalize that at a much faster pace. So that's what we're going to be looking to do over the next couple of years. And, uh, you know, I'm excited. The fact that we're a billion dollars, the fact that we have the financial resources and the 5,600 staff who are able to really help drive this business, I think should give our customers comfort that uh, after 30 years plus in business, we're still going to be here and still promoting these ideas, I think, in radically different ways. The one thing I'll tell you is when I look at the actual technologies that are being promulgated by this competition, I'm really positive because I see big differentiations between how we're thinking about this market and how many other companies are. And I think we have the potential here to really take a lot of the common buzzwords that are being said, which are frankly indistinguishable and showing how this can be done for real, for real organizations in a you know, very dynamic build for change world. Yeah, and I set. Uh, by the way, that uh, I set Daniel up to ask that question. So you know, but I think it's a it's a good question because uh, you know you can't swing a cat with somebody you know running into somebody that says, hey, yeah, I do that. I, I do I do this uh, uh, robotic process automation stuff too. What about you? And I think the market depends. Um, the overall health of the industry depends on more nimble companies to come up with the better ideas first. Um, and uh, what I what I like as well is a lot of the verticals that you're in are, are very, um, how should I say it? Um, uh, they get audited a, a lot by regulators. They're very highly regulated. So the level of precision that you have to put into your products and services to me have to be a level above, let's say, somebody who, you know, might heavily service retail, which isn't nearly as regulated as as banking or or something like that. 
I, I think regulated industries uh, or governments especially need the sort of things that we um, offer. But I think all industries have to be subject to being able to have a level of transparency, a level of trust. You know, the industries that are using AI but can't explain how it's being yeah. used can easily discriminate against customer segments, easily do things that will break trust with the consumers. And regardless of industry, I think that's something that should be top of mind for all executives. Oh, it is. Yeah. Why, why did that mortgage get, uh, you know, not get accepted? Oh, we can't tell you. We're sorry. That doesn't work with the regulators. So, uh, Alan, we've talked about your customers. Uh, you uh, uh, talked about your partners and, and how in most times they're actually the ones doing most of the upfront uh, customer to customer, uh, BPO type stuff. Uh, you have an event that's coming up uh, that combines all of those. Pega World Inspire 2021. Can you talk a little bit uh, about that? Uh, what's new? What are you bringing in there? Uh, I don't know if you can talk about, you know, what the what the key top line message is going to be. Maybe that's a, a surprise in a few weeks. It'd be great. Well, we don't want to we don't want to you know s destroy the show by announcing it <laughs> as much as you'd like to. But well, you it's could. Fabulous! <laughs> it's it starts uh, May fourth at nine a.m. Eastern time, and it's uh, going to star some amazing companies, um, some of which have been announced, like uh, Wells Fargo, uh, others which will be announced coming forward, telling their stories. So it's not just about what we're going to announce that's new for our technology, but it's going to be how customers are going to explain in their own words, frankly, in many cases, things that we wouldn't be allowed to say because we do have a lot of customers who compete with each other. But if they get up and want to say it, I think that's terrific. And uh, I'm always amazed that organizations are, um, well, so creative in how they're able to apply better decision making and better you know, intelligent automation or process automation and do it in ways that sometimes even exceed what we would have imagined. And that's what you're going to see at Pega World, plus some hot new product announcements. Can't wait. Pega oh, World. Well, I Thank mean, you. I'll take that as my invite. Uh, we'll, we'll be signing you out. I mean, who's not excited about a digital event? I mean, we've done so <laughs> few. But in all serious, I loved last year that you guys hit the punch lines quickly. Um, Pat and I are not that nice. We have our event. It's going to be five days long <laughs> in June. Um, I'll bug your PR people because we are hoping to get you there, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. But your event, you did it quick. It was really impactful, high information, and you were very respectful, Alan. And, 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 and as two analysts that cover probably some of the broadest east-west swaths of tech from software to chips, we could not be more appreciative of companies that are thoughtful about how much time they take to get to the point. Well, if we had done it in Las Vegas, um, or actually, sadly, this year, it had been intended to be done in Boston last year when the pandemic struck. We realized we weren't going to be able to hold an event last June in Boston, which was kind of sad. You know, instead of having order of magnitude 8,000 people at that physical event, you know, we ended up having, I would say, 10x that globally at the event or, or, or listening to pieces of it. But we knew we couldn't do a two-day event. So we cut it down to two and a half hours right. and really worked to make every piece of it as crisp, as information-filled, and also doing chunks of it live. So we were taking live Q&A from the audience to reward them for choosing to, to check in at that time. You know, and that coupled with having the drop kick, uh, the dropkick Murphys play us out at the end. That's sort of a Boston yeah. hometown band. I, you know, we got a lot of, I think, positive recognition. And it's all about the team being able to pivot literally in 60 days from thinking we were, you know, flying out to, to or having an in-person event to realizing that it was going to have to be a whole new way of thinking. Yeah, the team did a really good job, Alan. And by the way, you did a really good job. You've earned yourself an opportunity to return to the 6.5 Insiders. We'll give you a little time. We'll give you a little time, but uh, you know, we'll have you back in, in, in a few months or a year when it works out for all of our schedules. Love to hear how things are progressing. Love to kind of circle back on some of the 
uh, you know, theorizing and philosophizing that you did throughout the uh, throughout the show. But it's always super entertaining to have you here. Um, on behalf of the Six Five, Pat, myself, thanks so much for tuning in. We're gonna kick you out to the green room. We're gonna close up shop here. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Pat, I always love these shows. Um, what a great job, Alan is. You know, he's entertaining. He clearly knows his stuff. He's got a vision for the future, and uh, you know. I think they're yeah. on a great trajectory to get to that two billion if he stays the course. Yeah, and I'll add, not you know, informative uh, as well, informative and entertaining. Uh, but what I really appreciate is the velocity that that uh, Pega operates at, and and I think that keeps, I mean, that keeps it all going, right? Um, smaller companies, uh, uh, the gear is smaller and it's got to go faster, and it's coming up with uh, more ideas than you know, some of these uh, beh behemoths uh, out there. So yeah. I love to see it. Absolutely, and uh, we'll have to check back in with them really soon. But uh, Pat, I think uh, for this particular episode, it's time to kind of let the people know that, you know, hit that subscribe button, join us on Spotify, on Apple, uh, on Apple Podcasts, and of course on YouTube. We've got video, but if you're listening to this, um, you know, we like it when you do that too. Uh, yeah. You know, definitely subscribe, definitely hit us up on the Twitters at the 6.5 podcast or follow either one of us, hit us up. We're pretty approachable. We respond to most uh, normal type of tweets or interactions online. But overall, just want to say thank you to the community. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. We'll put some info on the show notes on Pega World Inspire. We'll also put some other uh, updates and highlights that we see fit. But for this episode, for Patrick Moorhead, for myself, Daniel Newman, we want to thank you for tuning in. And we'll see you next time on the 6.5. Bye, everyone.